Good evening, everyone. Um, if you can sort of make your way to a seat, um, that would be great. Head, head in and find yourself somewhere. Oh, yeah. Don't throw paper airplanes. <laughs> Sorry? <laughs> Hello. <laughs> Fantastic. It's, it's really lovely to have you all here, and it's really good that we have a range of people from across our churches in Putney and Roehampton. We've got, you can see, a little Catholic corner at the back, and, <laughs> um, and we, have, we have several Catholic religious here, um, which is wonderful, um, and the churches, the uh, Church of England church is all represented, which is lovely, and, and we have Methodists, and it's really good that we can come together as churches to sort of learn and think and discuss things together, and it's, I think, particularly um, good to do it in St. Margaret's, I mean, obviously I would say that, um, but we have that history of being a Baptist chapel, of being given to the Presbyterians and then becoming Church of England. So we are a naturally ecumenical church um, and a wonderful uh, place to explore themes of ecumenism. I was very keen that we have this sort of talk on ecumenism because it's a subject that has, in some ways, it feels like it's lost momentum and can easily lose momentum. So hopefully this will stimulate us as churches together in Putney and Roehampton to sort of think a little bit more and hopefully be inspired, no pressure, um, uh, into working together more in the coming years. Um, it's a delight to have Jeremy with us. Um, uh, I mentioned some of uh, Jeremy's past jobs um, as uh, at Westcott House, a, a theological college, um, at King's College Cambridge, and then at Trinity Hall Cambridge, and now being the perfect person to speak to this brief as the national advisor uh, to ecumenical matters in the Church of England. And he, of course, also comes straight from General Synod, which is in itself a sort of ecumenical um, situation, <laughs> stroke disaster. Um, so perhaps you will share some of that experience with us. But um, would you please uh, welcome Jeremy as our speaker tonight? Thank you. Oh, that's, your, that's your wine. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I hope this is, yes, it is working, good. Um, thank you very much, I'm delighted to be here. Um, it's great for me to have an opportunity to talk about uh, an ecumenical vision, I hope. Um, uh, actually, this is the first time I've done, I've only been in this post for eight months now, so this is the first time I've actually had an opportunity to do this in, if you like, a kind of local setting, so all the more appreci appreciated for that. I am a bit zoned out from General Synod, I have to say, because it's been a pretty exhausting few days. My, my role, I'm not a member of Synod, and, and I'm happy to talk about it in questions, perhaps I probably won't say much in, in, in my kind of main talk, but my role there is a function of my job. There are a number of ecumenical representatives who sit on General Synod, and it's my role to look after them, so to brief them on what's happening, to make sure that if they want to speak or are asked to speak, that they know how to go about that and so on. So that means, essentially, they have to be there all the time um, and sit through everything. But at the same time, there's also really, particularly this latest session, a really interesting um, a momentous uh, occasion, I think, for the Church of England. Um, whatever your views, I think things are not going to be quite the same again. So uh, it, it's certainly been very interesting. I think this lectern is slightly collapsing. So <laughs> <laughs> I will, I think, just make sure that that's, I think that's, I think that's right now. Yes, that's right. The kind of thing that, you know, set up as a trap. <laughs> um, so I, I, when Brutus asked me what I 
thought I could talk about in relation to um, Christian unity, I, I sort of set a question, um, really, which is, what has church unity got to do with mission? And the reason I set that is that, um, that task, really, for myself, is that uh, what I come across a lot at the moment in the Church of England, I, I don't know if this is quite the same in other churches, it may be, is a certain skepticism about ecumenism that rides on the back of a kind of feeling that we're in a crisis as a church and we really have to concentrate on building numbers up and saving the buildings and so on. And ecumenism is seen as a kind of unnecessary distraction or luxury or something like that. And I want to argue very, very strongly against that view. I want to argue that essentially the search for Christian unity is absolutely central to our vision of what Christian mission is. And I'll give some reasons for that. So I'm going to try and answer my own question, what's church unity got to do with mission, in sort of three steps. It's a bit like a kind of three-point sermon. But um, the first stage is really just trying to give some sense of a theological vision of church unity and why it really matters and why it's very important that Christians don't neglect it and why it's central to what we are as Christians. Then I want to look perhaps a little bit more briefly at uh, uh, the, the question, what have we done? Where have we ended up? What's gone wrong, if you like? Where are we now? Um, and then finally, I want to, and, and really quite briefly, too briefly, but you might want to ask me questions about it, to talk about where are we going to next? How do we recover a full commitment to Christian unity. But before that, um, I mean, I thought I'll just add a little bit to what Brutus has said and give just a little bit of my own sort of background on how I became interested in, uh, in the search for church unity. Because although I've been in this job for just eight months, it's actually been something that's really been central to my ministry, to my kind of academic interests as a church historian and theologian, to the work I've done for the Church of England in a voluntary capacity really over the years. I was brought up in uh, a suburb of Croydon, um, so not very far from here. Um, I come from a uh, ordinary parish background. Um, just down the road from um, where I lived um, is uh, a Catholic church. When I was growing up in the 1960s, um, the priest at the Catholic Church was a sort of pre-Vatican II Irish uh, priest, Father Salmon. Um, my parents had been brought up, I think, essentially in a kind of polemical world in which uh, there was a lot of prejudice about Catholics. Um, I I'm actually married to a Roman Catholic, so that, was, <laughs> that became a slight complication later on. But anyway, um, and I grew up with a sense that... that what happened every Sunday morning, the cars arrived from all over the place and parked in our road. Something went on in that church down the end of the road that I knew nothing about and had nothing to do with the church where I sang in the choir and so on. There was a Baptist church um, sort of roughly the same distance the other way and again, likewise, uh, we knew things went on there. We had no idea what went on there. Never the twain should meet, as it were. Um, that situation, of course, has completely changed now and uh, you know we have I mean I, I imagine a meeting like this with the group we have here wouldn't have been possible 50 years ago or at least would have been very unlikely uh, there's been a sea change in the way we relate to each other as Christians over that time um, and I think I've been kind of caught up in a lot of that so um, not just because I'm married to a Roman Catholic but when I studied um, theology uh, at Cambridge years after I, I, mean, I went as a mature student having done other things before um, I had as a director of studies a man who was on the Anglican Roman Catholic International Commission and I think it was really through him that I started to think more seriously about how Anglicans relate to Roman Catholics theologically, what are the issues what divides us still should it and so on and then I started to get drawn into active um, ecumenical work. When I was vice principal of a theological college, for example, I organized um, a joint study week with a German colleague in one of the, the German state churches, um, the Kohlhessen-Waldeck Church. And for several years, 
uh, every summer we took a group of Anglican students over to Germany or they came over to England, a kind of Lutherans, Lutheran Anglican study week. Uh, and that was enormously interesting, really, really fascinating to sit down in the same room with people who from a completely different Christian tradition in theory and find you had so much in common and so much of a kind of common outlook. And yet there were things that were interesting about the differences. So that and various other things kind of really stimulated my interest and I then got actively drawn into, I was on the Church of England's Faith and Order Advisory Group and then its Faith and Order Commission for, for a good many years. And again, I was sent abroad, uh, I took part in various dialogues and so on. So I think in a way, my life, and this will be true for many of you, has actually coincided with the sort of um, the up, real upsurge post-war in uh, enthusiasm for Christian unity, and then more recently, a kind of decline in the sense, uh, uh, maybe, a, I'll come on to, as I say, to, to why this has happened, a, a sort of seeping away of interest in the pursuit of, of church unity. Um, so that's sort of something of how I came to be where I am now. And you know, when this job came up, I just thought this is absolutely my thing. So first of all, what is a theological basis for mission and unity? This is going to be very sketchy inevitably, but um, you see, the, it's not often realized that the origins of the modern ecumenical movement really lay in mission. The, uh, sort of two dimensions to this. One is that in the overseas mission field at the end of the 19th century and at the beginning of the 20th century, particularly between the Protestant denominations, so Anglicans, Baptists, Methodists, um, Congregationalists as were Presbyterians, the perception grew increasingly that they were basically, they were very, very thin. It's often forgotten that there were very few Christian missionaries. I mean, um, there were no more missionaries across the whole world at the beginning of the 20th century than there were clergy in the Church of England alone at the beginning of the 20th century. So these people were very, very thinly spread, and then they had various auxiliary lay assistants and so on. It made no sense to be involved in a competitive relationship between Anglicans and Methodists or Methodists and Congregationalists and so on in the mission field. So they started to form informal arrangements, these were called comity arrangements, whereby they agreed that they would carve up uh, you know, areas that one mission society would deal with but not another and so on. Once you start to do that, of course, you're already engaging in a form of ecumenism because what you're doing is saying, um, we are all in this together, um, interested in, in in, in making disciples for Christ, we have a common purpose. We are not going to be in competition. Um, so that happened in the mission field. The highlight, really, of that, uh, the high point of that um, movement was the great um, uh, conference at Edinburgh in 1910, organized by the World Missionary uh, Conference. Um, and that is often held up as the real start of the modern ecumenical movement. Um, of course, as you'll know, four years later came the First World War and the cooperation that had been emerging between the British and American and then the German um, missionary societies was halted uh, and there was a kind of hiatus. But that only spurred on even more determination in the interwar period to find a way of working together. And it's out of that kind of... Um, feeling that eventually what became the World Council of Churches uh, emerged. So the, the overseas missionary field was the crucible of the modern ecumenical movement. But there were also similar pressures at home, uh, domestically, if you like. Um, whilst there were not the equivalent of the comity arrangements, there was a very strong feeling amongst 19th century churchmen that, um, and of course they were nearly all men, um, as leaders in the, of the churches, that uh, the challenge of reaching um, those who, uh, for one reason or another, 
weren't attending church, perhaps didn't have the kind of, kind of Christian formation that clergy thought they should have, was so great that they ought to explore ways of cooperating properly. And there are a number of sort of, um, uh, let's say, uh, stalled initiatives. So, for example, in 1882 and 1883, there were conversations between William Booth of the Salvation Army and the Archbishops of Canterbury, two successive Archbishops, Archbishop Tate and Archbishop Benson, about whether the, the Salvation Army could move into the Church of England and work through the Church of England. Now, nothing came of that. It probably was never really going to work. But it's interesting that that, that was a sort of first one of the early sort of signs of this impulse. There were again further moves, um, partly in the, in the United States, but also in Britain in the 1880s to try and explore um, ways of rebuilding the links between the Church of England and the free churches. Again, that happened after the First World War. Um, the Lambeth Conference in 1920 issued an appeal, it's called an appeal to all Christian peoples, which was uh, really calling on um, the worldwide Christian churches to see if there were ways in which they could, uh, together with Anglicans, find, uh, find a new form of, a new way of, uh, of, of coming together. So even, um, in a sense, uh, uh, overseas, at home, mission was, in a sense, as I say, the crucible of the modern ecumenical movement. It wasn't, it would have occurred to no one in the early 20th century to say that missions got nothing to do with church unity. But there are theological reasons. That was this kind of historical background. I, I want to just look briefly at some scriptural texts um, and, and really argue that this is so central. The notion of unity is so central to the New Testament that we cannot grasp uh, really the full witness of the New Testament unless we take it into account. And we have to make a distinction, I think, between evangelism, which is the activity that churches do, and mission, which is God's. We are, are not, we may be agents of mission, but it is not our mission. It is God's mission in which we, as Christians, participate. Once you make that mental move, then, of course, you have to begin to, in a sense, to unpack that and to think in terms of a unity that, that inheres in God, that is the unity that we ought all to exemplify in, in our own lives. And once you kind of recognize that, you just find that all over the New Testament. I'll start with probably the most famous text, the text, in a sense, that's used again and again and again in the ecumenical movement, this provided the title of one of John Paul II's uh, encyclicals on, uh, on unity. It's from the 17th chapter of uh, the Gospel of St. John, the, uh, from the prayer that's sometimes called the high priestly prayer um, uh, at the center of what are sometimes also called the farewell, di farewell discourses. Um, so this is um, verses 6 to 11 of chapter 70. I have manifested your name, this is Jesus addressing God, I have manifested your name to the men whom you gave me out of the world. They were yours and you gave them to me and they have kept your word. Now they have come to know that everything you have given me is from you. For the words which you gave me I have given to them and they received them and truly understood that I came forth from you and they believed that you sent me I ask on their behalf, I do not ask on behalf of the world, but of those whom you have given me, for they are yours, and all things that are mine and are yours, and yours are mine, and I have been glorified in them. I am no longer in the world, and yet they themselves are in the world, and I come to you. Holy Father, keep them in your name, the name which you have given me, that they may be one, even as we are. In other words, the unity of Christ's followers is rooted in the unity between Jesus and the Father. And that phrase occurs again uh, two more times in the same chapter. For example, in verses 20 to 21, I do not ask on behalf of these alone, but for those also who believe in me through their word, that they may all be one, 
even as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they may also be in us, so that the world may believe that you sent me. In other words, the unity of the Father and the Son should be exemplified in the unity of Christians, so that the world may believe. We just hold on to that thought. When we turn to the writings of St. Paul, I mean, there are various other texts from the Gospels that I could quote that really build or witness to or exemplify that theme. But when we turn to the writings of St. Paul, we're dealing, of course, in a sense with a a situation, a a generation on, perhaps half a generation on with the early uh, Pauline epistles, but um, uh, let's say somewhere between you know, 15 to 20, 30 years on. And we're dealing with communities of Christians that have come into being throughout the eastern half of the Roman Empire and are beginning to encounter the difficulties of Christian belonging. And really, the whole of the first letter to the Corinthians is about unity. The unity of Christians and why it isn't happening and why it ought to happen. So, Paul, in the first chapter, for example, says, Now I exhort you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all agree, and that there be no divisions among you, you, but that you be made complete in the same mind and in the same judgment. For I have been informed concerning you, my brethren, by Chloe's people, that there are quarrels among you. Now I mean this, that each one of you is saying, I am of Paul, and I of Apollos, and I of Kephas, and I of Christ. Run that text with, I am of Justin Welby, I am of Pope Francis, you know, you get the point. And that theme runs again all the way through the first letter to the Corinthians. So that in, when we come to chapter 11, and we're dealing with um, early Christian worship, what is almost certainly uh, the Eucharist um, in a a, a very uh, informal, uh, perhaps, form, And there we find that Paul is pointing to the divisions that are arising. Um, Sorry, I've got this, is that right? Yes, that's right, I've got there. There's very small print in this and my eyes are beginning to go. For in the first place, when you came together as a church, I hear that divisions exist among you, and in part I believe it. For there must also be factions among you, so that those who are approved may become evident among you. Therefore, when you meet together, it is not to eat the Lord's Supper, for in your eating, each one takes his own supper first, and one is hungry and another is drunk. In other words, they're no longer eating together. They're no longer sharing the body of Christ together. Essentially, they're beginning to separate as a community, and as it transpires, Paul is describing the way the rich are beginning to have, you know, to keep things to themselves and excluding others and so on. And again, he then goes on to talk about unity in the Spirit. Now, there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are varieties of ministries and the same Lord. There are varieties of effects, but the same God who works all things in all persons. That idea, again, that the unity of God inheres in us as Christians and ought to be exemplified in our lives. And he goes on elsewhere to talk about the unity of the body and the unity of baptism. For even as the body is one and yet has many members, and all the members of the body, though they are many, are one body, so also is Christ. For by one Spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and we were all made to drink of one Spirit. Now, you know, you can follow that same theme in other writings of Paul. The letter to the Galatians, for example, where Paul really does lose his temper with a Christian community who are falling out with each other and he thinks, uh, as it were, abandoning the truth that he had taught them. But in the letter to the Ephesians, which some scholars would say is not by Paul himself but exemplifies certain sort of themes of Paul, we have perhaps one of the most powerful statements of this unity. 
Therefore I, the prisoner of the Lord, implore you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, showing tolerance for one another, in love, being diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as also you were called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. Paul is very clear that there are different gifts, and indeed in Ephesians, the text goes on to talk about that. We've already seen that he talks about that in 1 Corinthians. There are different gifts. There are different uh, offices, if you like, different responsibilities in the church. But there is one body, just as there is one Jesus and one God. So, I think it's probably not putting it too strongly to say that uh, an overwhelming theme of the New Testament witness is that uh, where there is disunity amongst Christians, it's not just the church is damaged, the church actually effectively ceases to exist. Division amongst Christians destroys the body of Christ. How can we think that that is, as it were, of no account in relation to mission? Now, Christians have interpreted unity differently, of course. Historic differences have arisen amongst us in the course of 2,000 years. We are all creatures of the fall. I might say a little in a moment about how uh, I see something of that having happened, for example, in Anglicans' um, relationships with the Methodist churches. Christians have interpreted uni unity differently. The Catholic uh, witness, for example, is very much focused on the notion of a visible center of unity. Focused perhaps in the from the Roman Catholics, for example, in the person uh, and the uh, authority of um, the, the papacy. The Reformation vision was really of a unity that was a unity of faith, a unity, of course, in Jesus Christ, but exemplified above all in a doctrinal agreement. Although it's very important to recognize that even for Protestants at the time of the Reformation, the notion of a unity of the visible church, of the institutional church, was hugely important. Um, I didn't have the time, because I've been in Synod for the last four days, I didn't have the chance to dig out my copy of Calvin's Institutes. But in the fourth book of, of Calvin's Institutes of the Christian Religion, you do find this distinction drawn out quite clearly between the visible and the invisible church. So Calvin says that basically the invisible church is the church of Jesus Christ as it, is, as it exists throughout the world, throughout the universe. It, it is a spiritual reality that can't be harmed by anything that human beings do. And then there is the visible church, the institutional church. But he, what people often forget is he goes on to say that basically the visible church is mother to us all. And to separate from the visible church is... Um, is well, it, it, it is, for him, almost the worst sin. So even Calvin has, although he has this distinction between the invisible church and the visible church, what he thinks really is that these two should practically coincide. That's a very, very sobering thought when you think about our history of denominational identities and how that has come into being and how we do so many things differently. Um, despite even the progress that we've made in the last 50, 60 years. So, secondly, I want to talk about how, given all of that, have we ended up where we are? What have we done? What's gone wrong, if you like? Where are we now? Well, um, I talked about the change that's happened just, in a sense, in my lifetime. Um, it's too complicated for me to... Uh, discuss all the factors that have led to the, the emergence of a kind of very different view of unity amongst Christian churches in the late 19th, 20th century and on to the present. But, you know, things we could list might be, for example, the declining political rhetoric of religion. Um, obviously, 
Uh, this has changed faster in some places than in others, but in this country in particular, the decline of anti-Catholic polemic, um, the decline of sectarian tensions in kind of most parts of the country. This is, you know, part um, cause, part effect, really, of ecumenical sensitivities. Globalization, you know, increased travel, the fact that people have seen more of the world, been able to encounter each other's churches, uh, more and more and so on. That obviously has helped. Um, there have been intellectual changes, um, growth of scholarship, uh, the rise, if you like, of publishing industry with texts made available so that people could really begin to understand what other Christian churches have said in the past and so on. Probably underlying all of that, in particular in the West, has been the end of the kind of European era of religious conflict of the sort of 16th through to the early 18th century. The fact that, you know, the de modern development of the state has really sort of taken um, conflict out of the hands of religious organizations, put it elsewhere, perhaps. But that has been part of this background movement. And so that all set the scene for this extraordinary um, outburst of energy um, in the early 20th century. Um, uh, focused on the search for, for, for Christian unity, in which, as I say, no notion that this was at all separate from um, our ideas of mission was, you, could be found at all. And that movement has, had, has led to many, many achievements, and it's really important not to forget that. I, here's just a few. So, what we call the united or uniting churches, the Church of South India, where Anglicans, Methodists, Congregationists, Presbyterians uh, came together to form a single church, um, uh, which now is a member of the Anglican Communion, but has its own local tradition still. Um, the Church of North India uh, is another uh, good example. There are a number of uniting churches in Australia, for example, in Canada, um, uh, uh, for example, where Methodists, Congregationists, Presbyterians have come together. Um, this, then in, in this country, the various Methodist churches came back together in the, 19, uh, the beginning of the 1930s. The Scottish churches reunited in the 1920s. The United Reformed Church came into being in 1972 by the combination of the Congregationists and the Presbyterians in this country. Now, in some ways, some of those um, unions are unions within a relatively narrow range of theological disagreement, if you like. They, they emerged, particularly Presbyterians and congregations, had a kind of shared theological tradition. But still, that's a major achievement. Then the emergence of these worldwide instruments of church unity, the World Council of Churches, the faith and order movement within it that the Catholic Church participates in, um, the local ecumenical, so the national churches together in England, for example. And of course, in many um, in many localities, you know, there were, sometimes still are, local uh, councils of churches. These are major achievements, inconceivable, or at least seeming nothing more than a dream a century ago. And then there have been really, really substantial theological agreements. I think probably the most startling, still think it is probably the most significant of all, is the um, conclusion in 2000, of the uh, joint, what's called the Joint Declaration on the Doctrine of Justification between Roman Catholics and Lutherans. In other words, after you know, nearly 500 years of separation and mutual anathema, you know, saying that, uh, in effect, declaring each other heretics and so on, Anglic uh, Roman Catholics and Lutherans agreed on, effectively, a common understanding of the Doctrine of Justification. Um, and subsequently, the Methodist Church, the Anglican Communion, uh, and I think the World Alliance of Reformed Churches have also signed up to that. That is a major, major uh, achievement. Then the Anglican Roman Catholic um, International Commission, its various documents, have also achieved really extraordinary agreements. It is no longer realistically possible to say, for example, that Anglicans and Roman Catholics have completely different understandings of the Eucharist. This is just not true. 
It's also not true to say that we have completely different understandings of what, for example, a bishop is or of what the ministry is. Um, again, not true. We have done major work on these things. Um, we have not achieved the really big goal, for example, obviously, of uh, unity between Anglicans and Roman Catholics. But this is, I think the, the um, late Cardinal Cormac Murphy O'Connor said, these things are money in the bank. The work has been done. It's really important to hold on to this, um, to, to what we have achieved. But we have also, I think, uh, found ourselves living through a time of what's sometimes called an ecumenical winter, when um, we've seen, in a way, the energy draining away from the ecumenical movement. I think probably church decline, declining attendances, the pressures mounting on uh, all our churches, have, have had a role in that. They have encouraged a kind of inward turn. Um, it's, we, have, we have, I think, given in too easily to the temptation um, to forget that we share in God's mission and to think of uh, mission as really building up our own churches. So finally, and I'm conscious of the time and I you know, would really value your reactions, questions, and so on. If that's where we've got to... Um, you know, I, I'll just use my own job as a kind of instance of that. Um, probably five, six years ago, there were something like six people employed centrally in the Church of England to cover ecumenical relations. Four of them were based in Church House. Two of them worked at Lambeth Palace. Now there's only me. And I, I have uh, one day a week of another person. And I have managed to claw back money so that we've, uh, we're appointing someone who's starting in, in three months' time who will deal with a lot of the local kind of ecumenism. So let's just say that we've gone down in, a, in about five, six years from six people to, to, to just over two. That's the sort of sign of where priorities have shifted, I think. And I think it's, it's a crying shame. So how do we, where do we get to? How do we recover a full commitment to church unity, to the pursuit of church unity? Well, you know, I'm not going to stand here and say, um, uh, you know, it's one last shove and then we're there. I mean, this is a long, long, long task. It is a probably, uh, you know, uh, at a point somewhere in the future that one has to think of a possible reun um, reunification of all the Christian churches. It's a long task. Overcoming the divisions of history is a long piece of work. Uh, and, but the really important thing is that we ought to be committed to it and we ought to be pursuing it with all the energy we can as part of our mission uh, in the world, part of our part in God's mission in the world. And I'll give one example, and I said I would talk about the Anglican uh, Methodist division. I mean, as many of you will know, and I'm sure those of you particularly who are Methodists, essentially the Wesley brothers were ordained as Anglican ministers and did not want to separate from the Church of England. The movement they founded was a movement of renewal within the Church of England. Uh, they saw it as something that would rejuvenate the parish mission, the parish ministry of the Church of England. That's why they always tried to work in association with local parish ministers. Sometimes they met opposition. So they were regarded with a lot of suspicion sometimes. I, I tend to think of them as something like a fresh expression of church, to use that phrase we come across now, in the 18th century. They had particular theological emphases that were not shared by all Anglicans at the time, but nonetheless, they saw themselves as uh, doing nothing more, in a sense, than trying to, if you like, reboot, to refresh the ministry of the Church of England, in which they both strongly believed. Charles Wesley never cut adrift from the Church of England. John Wesley only did it very, very reluctantly towards the end of his life when he was really forced into making a decision to allow the ordination of ministers, uh, above all for the American context, and this was in the wake of the American Revolution, but then also in Britain, um, because by then he was being virtually ignored um, and um, uh, uh, not quite excommunicated, but that's putting it a little bit too, um, too ecclesiastically, but being ignored.
by uh, the bishops of the Church of England at the time. So that was in the 1780s and 1790s. The Church of England of the 1880s and 1890s would never have allowed that to happen. The Church of England in the course of the 19th century, partly because of its split with the Methodists, radically overhauled its organization, it created new dioceses, it started new mission agencies. Um, I've already mentioned the Salvation Army. Well, of course, the failure of the Salvation Army talks led in part to the creation of the Church Army as a kind of um, Im imitation of the Salvation Army. The Church of England, by the 18, actually by the 1850s, 1860s, was involved in really extensive mission work in the inner cities, um, echoing in so many ways what the Wesley brothers were seeking to do in the 18th century. But by the 1880s and 1890s, Methodism itself had changed. It had become much more self-consciously a, a, a denomination in its own right, having been very, very conservative politically, because the Methodist brothers were, um, it became, it started to move in a more radical direction. It became, uh, to some extent, anti-establishment. Um, Methodism underwent further splits itself. You get the primitive Methodist movement, the you know, free Methodist church, the, the Calvinistic Methodist church in Wales, and so on. So the divisions in our history have kind of, as time has gone by, have rebounded on each other and have, have, have widened. And you find by the end of the 19th century, Anglican clergy using the most appalling language about free church, Methodist ministers. They would talk about dissent implanting itself in a parish like a disease or a virus. Um, they were asked in the process of visitations when bishops um, ran visitation, um, visitations through their diocese. The, 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 the questionnaires would ask how many dissenters are there in, in your parish and so on. So they, they had to kind of identify this division. So history has, in a way, taken divisions that were often, or tensions that were often unfortunate, sometimes personality-based, sometimes divisions of principle, differences of, a, of principle, and widened them. And resetting all of that is profoundly important, but also incredibly difficult. So we're engaged in a long, long process, I think, in the ecumenical movement of essentially reconciliation, trying to undo the faults of our own history, the ways we've insulted each other, the ways we've marginalized each other and given and often told rather sad stories about each other, and trying to undo all of that and return to um, a, a fully united vision, con conviction, um, uh, of, of what it means to be the body of Christ. It's a long haul. And um, I, I, I can only think of this really in terms of a kind of convergent trajectory. Um, there are, there may be, you know, some immediate gains to be had. I mean, I have a number of priorities for the next few years, things that I think that we can achieve. Um, uh, I think we, for example, need to pick up again the Anglican Methodist proposals because we have come so close. We need to work at that again. We have a lot of work to do with the Pentecostal churches who are becoming more and more engaged in the ecumenical movement. Uh, it's been extraordinary um, diversification of the Orthodox churches in this country in the last 20 years. That poses um, really important questions to us and so on. And then we have our major relationship with the Catholic Church that has its own, I mean, really strong and very, very buoyant um, bonds of affection, I think, between our churches in so many ways. These are all really important and they've got to be worked at. But we have to see ourselves as on trying to be on a convergent trajectory. And so I think this becomes a kind of moral question for Christians, really. You know, we need to be open to, we need to be able to open ourselves up to the convictions and the insights of others and prepare to learn from them and to prepare to think ourselves, for example, me as an Anglican, as an Anglican, as a convinced Anglican, nonetheless, what am I prepared to change? How am I prepared to see myself from the standpoint of another person? What defense do I give? And so on. 
This is all uh, reflected. There's a, a, a theological movement at the moment called receptive ecumenism, um, which started with a Roman Catholic scholar called Paul Murray and has become very um, influential in some circles. And it really reflects that same kind of moral imperative, I think. We have to be open to learning from our fellow Christians because we are all one in the body of Christ. Anyway, I'm going to finish there because I'd love to hear what you have to say and what questions you have. So thank you Wonderful. for listening. Um, before we go to questions, I always think it's quite nice just to have a minute, literally like a minute, to turn to the person next to you or to go into a reverie on your own and just think about what your comment or your question is or to share that with the person next to you. Just for one minute. Thank you. Wonderful. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Um, if you thought of a question, that's great. I'm going to take my host's prerogative and just ask on the basis <laughs> of today's decision in the yeah. Church of England yeah, yeah. Um, to, to move to a more progressive stance on same-sex relationships. That's often been portrayed as something which will be damaging to ecumenical relations and the worldwide churches. Um, and, and do you think that this decision has made your job more difficult? Um, almost certainly it has, but probably not as difficult as any other decision would have been, if that makes, makes sense. Um, I mean, I think, um, and we, we did quite a lot of, and I obviously was, this was sort of part of my job really, quite a lot of modeling of what different outcomes from today's debate might mean. So when, for example, the vote on the ordination of women uh, bishops went through uh, the, the, the dialogue between the Anglican Communion and the Orthodox um, was suspended for a time. Um, I think there's a likelihood that had the Church of England gone for a, a more radical outcome than it has at the moment, uh, that we would have seen something similar. I mean, that's almost, that almost goes without saying. I'm not sure about the relationship with the Roman Catholic Church, but I think, again, it's likely that that this would be yet a further um, um, cause of, 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 of division. Of course, on the other hand, the Methodist Church and the United Reformed Church, um, you know, if you can look at these things as a kind of continuum, are ahead of us in terms of the decisions they've made. So, you know, a, a, more, a, a more radical, progressive decision would have made that set of relationships a bit easier, probably. Um, whereas I think where we've ended up is a kind of typical Anglican fudge. Um, but... You know, I've got a very sweet tooth and I like fudge. Um, so, uh, but, but, you know, it is. Um, and there, there are many people who want to see change one direction or another. It's, it, you know, but I actually think this today is quite a significant change. And it is going to have a significant effect on the Church of England, if you like, at ground level. So I think... Uh, my answer is that, 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 yes, it probably will make some things more difficult. But what I want to be very clear, and I realize perhaps I didn't say this, uh, perhaps I didn't say this, uh, you know, um, strongly enough. There are no cheap and easy answers in all of this. I mean, there are. Um, of course, uh, parts of the world church are on different, you know, almost on different, um, uh, like people going up different escalators at different speeds, you know. Uh, some are moving faster on one thing, some are moving in a different direction. These issues are very complicated and very difficult. Um, you know, today's um, the discussion yesterday and today, although it, 
it looks like it's simply about, you know, what two people do in bed together. It's actually about how we interpret the Bible, what we make of Christian tradition, um, you know, even what we think about the sacraments, uh, and so on. They're very complex questions, and, and all we can do, in a sense, is travel together in faith and hope that there will be, in the end, uh, uh, an outcome to them. So there are no easy, quick answers. The fact that... Uh, a church does one thing that it believes to be right that makes a relationship with another church more difficult is not a reason for that church not to do it, I think. We'll go over to the Catholic corner over here. Can you use the microphone, please? <laughs> what I find, I'm never sure what it means by we shall all be one. Yes. In fact, I think that would be very boring. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I do. I think <laughs> it's wonderful here at Catholic. I can come into this church here. Yeah. Um, and I think we Christians are a very small minority, but I think the wonderful thing is the different traditions. And I, as a Catholic, love going to Evensong. I've just been to a wonderful Presbyterian, Welsh Presbyterian funeral, and I think that I think it is so, con it is the different colours of the Christian church. And the most wonderful thing, I'm not being condemned for being a Catholic. I remember going to, as a young Catholic, we were not allowed to pray in a non-Catholic church because that would bring scandal. Um, and also, I've met lots of Protestants who don't or didn't believe that I, as a Catholic, was a Christian. So yes, it's wonderful. We can love each other. We can respect each other. But I don't think I want to be one. I want to have a great variety of the Well, I, th I think I would say in answer to that, that unity is not uniformity. Um, the Church of England is probably has, probably has the widest possible variations in styles of worship, approach to things, and so on, of any church in Western Christendom. I mean, in, and, and I, I'm not saying that that's a problem. You, you know, um, diversity is not a problem. But what I think is a problem, for example, is the, the, um, the mixed marriages where the partner cannot receive communion in the Catholic Church, for example, or um, those instances where, you know, there are churches that could, uh, could help each other locally, where it doesn't happen. Um, you know, I think whether or not you have to have a single model of a kind of fully united church or whether you have something that's much more organic, I, I'm not sure. Don't want to, to lose uniformity at all, but I do think it's important that we fully understand what's entailed in that uniformity and that it, in that diversity and that it's not premised on... Uh, uh, an assumption that we've got it right and the others have got it wrong. Any more questions? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I was uh, reading Jerry O'Collins in the tablet this week, yeah. saying how Anglicans don't understand Balthazar and Rana in the Catholic tradition, how they sort of set them against each other, and it's a bit of a joke for Catholics. Um, just wondering whether that's another thing we sometimes don't acknowledge. There's a huge amount of cross fertilization yes of course yeah of, of, of yeah. theological which we sometimes don't recognize we're so used yeah. to it yeah i mean that you're saying how much we should perhaps we should treasure that more yeah. yeah yeah absolutely absolutely i mean i i think um uh i think it'd be true to say that uh in this country at least the major protestant traditions and i'm including anglicans in that have actually been quite kind of um, eclectic in their theological influences so i mean i've been strongly influenced by uh the, the great anglican theologian austin farrow but he in turn was strongly influenced by aquinas and by catholic neo-thomism and so on so of course uh this is absolutely right and a, a lot of um modern anglican systematic theologians strongly influenced in turn by von balthasar uh, but also by Karl Barth, of course. So there's been a lot of theological cross-fertilization. I mean, another influence would be John Zizioulas from the Orthodox side. Uh, yeah, absolutely. And, and there is a sense in which, I mean, I think it's rather, um, uh, I think it's, 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 a, it's a rather good thing that on the Anglican cycle, the Anglican calendar, we celebrate saints from across the Christian traditions. So, yes, absolutely, absolutely. You, you haven't really dealt with um, issues of governance yeah. of different denominations yeah. as being a major factor, but yeah. I wonder if they aren't actually more important than theological differences, ultimately. Um, 
I mean, the Church of England, of course, it was an issue of governance. There was plenty of reform thinking, but it was an issue of governance between the king and the pope that created us. Yes. And um, I wonder if it isn't as much as anything that that makes us reluctant to become part of the Roman Catholic Church. <laughs> and I'm not sure that the differences between Methodists and Anglicans really are much more than must they really become subject to a certain Episcopalian way of thinking about yeah. things that they'd side, sort of put on one side. What do you think? Um, I don't think you can really divide theology and governance. I mean, governance has, models of governance have theological justification. Um, of course, in, in some cases, I mean, you, you, the English Reformation was very obviously, it's probably is the most startling example of a kind of, you know, thinking up the justification of something after it happened. You know, <laughs> we, we know there was, there was basically a state, uh, 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 it was all about royal power ultimately. So uh, that had to be in some sense legitimated. But in, 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 in general terms, I mean, you know, you could say, all right, we have a difference um, uh, which we've been trying to work through in the Anglican Method discussions about the role of episcopacy and the relation, in particular the relation of episcopacy to priesthood and the celebration of the Eucharist. Um, but there are theological reasons behind that. And we are trying to explore whether our theological reasons are, as it were, primary or secondary. If they are, in some sense, secondary, then we can probably find a way of working together on this. So I think in the end, these, you, you can't simply kind of pull these things apart and say, well, it's really just the sort of pra practical aspect of governance. They, 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 they bleed into each other, if you like, in the end, I think. I mean, the, the difficulty, there is a real difficulty for the Church of England's, other Anglican churches, ecumenical partners, of course, which is really that the Church of England is three churches, not one. It's three different traditions rolled up into one. So, you know, it's not surprising that you have, you know, uh, Catholic Anglican bishops who are particularly interested in ecumenism with the Orthodox and the Roman Catholics, and you have, you know, it, it, it's, it's no surprise that the lead bishop, the Pentecostals, is a charismatic evangelical. Um, you know, the, and, and therefore, if you sit in a room, and I've done this, for example, I'm a member of an Anglican Roman Catholic, um, an informal conversation group called the Malene Conversations Group. When I look round the room, all the Anglicans present are people rather like me, you know, sort of you know, high Anglicans, really. There aren't any evangelicals in the group. Um, and that's a perennial problem for our ecumenical partners, I think. So th there are, um, I'm straight slightly far from the governance question, but in the end, it's a governance question for the Church of England. <laughs> uh, that, you know, we're trying to hold this broad range of, 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 of theological um, variety together uh, in a single polity. Um, so... I just wonder if um, the, the um, mission side of what you've been talking about has been a little bit overlooked tonight. I mean, it seems to me, as a lay person, that what we really need to be doing is to be spreading the gospel. Yeah. And it's not really much. Yeah, of course. Or, yeah. You know, it's it's yeah. a danger of becoming rather inward looking if we yeah. to think about the theological small points. Yeah. I mean, no, they're not small. Well, I'm standing here as, a, a, you know, in a sense, as an ecumenical expert or whatever. So my, you know, if, if, if you had one of my colleagues who was, uh, say, you know, an advisor on mission evangelism, he'd be approaching it from a different angle. But he wouldn't necessarily be disagreeing with me. He'd just be emphasizing something rather different. My, my point is simply that uh, when we talk about ecumenism in church circles at the moment, we often put it behind or put it in the back pocket or whatever because we think that all, all we have to do is, is mission. I'm just saying these things can't be separated ultimately. But absolutely, that's what we are as Christians here for, the salt and light for the world. Um, I, I wonder if ecumenism might actually be a bit of a red herring today when we are not insulting each other. We, there is a tolerance and there is a spirit of, a spirit of unity, uh, it's, especially today when it's really believers are, are, are so much, much in the minority against the, not against, but compared with the apathetic vast majority, that there is a sense of believers together. And 
isn't there something healthy about competition? Uh, you, 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 you see it as a sort of zero sum, but perhaps the vibrancy of um, Christianity in no North America, at least relatively speaking, is thanks to the vast choice of, um, of, of, of places, of churches to worship. And they do compete with each other, and, and that is, um, and that, that is, can be helpful. And I, I wouldn't be surprised if the missionaries, um, were, it, was a, it was a sort of constructive competition. It, it may have been for the wrong reasons that uh, you wanted more Methodists than Anglicans um, converted, but, uh, but it still had the effect of mission. And, and so, sorry to undermine the entire premise of your job. But no, that's all right. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's interesting to hear. Yeah, I, uh, but I'm, I think we're back with this unity is not uniformity this year. I mean, you know, of course there are different, uh, uh, if you like, different traditions within Christianity, different emphases. Um, uh, there always will be because people are different. But when, it, when, as I say, that that is premised on the sense that your perception of the truth is the correct one and that others are wrong, that becomes a problem, I think. And if we turn, translate, you know, for example, this into today's context, context of a you know, general synod argument today, what you see are competing truth claims that are irreconcilable ultimately, at least as they stand at the moment. But those differences are profoundly hurtful for people. And, and, I, and I don't think, whilst I, I recognize what you're saying, in relation to the American context, for example, of course, the American context has rather different sort of, you know, spatial, um, you know, in, in the kind of, the, the American kind of context has depended on, uh, on, if you like, a kind of freedom to expand beyond, uh, you know, the established um, borders or boundaries of a city or whatever. Europe's very different because Europe has had over a thousand years of settled religious communities. So, in a sense, dissent in Europe has emerged in opposition to existing churches, and that's a very different thing. But even in America, they have a very vibrant ecumenical scene. So, I, I, I only go a little way with you, I think. <laughs> I was wondering if you could just um, reflect on the role of communities like Teze, yeah. where you get people from all over the world, from varieties of yeah. the whole Christian traditions, yeah. meeting in one place, camping, it's quite uncomfortable, but also different, mm. out of comfort zones and with a chance just to talk in a loosely structured way and learn and grow in faith, and particularly young people. What are the role for places and communities like that? Oh, it's, I, th I think it's really important. And actually, in a way, th th thank you, Ruth, you're, um, you're reminding me that this is partly an answer to the question about uniformity again and also even about competition. The more, the, the better we learn to live as true Christians, the more the differences fall away from us. That's the important, or become less important, or become, or cease to be divisive. Um, and, and clearly, communities like Teze are models in which that, you know, that can happen, I think. So yes, absolutely. Um, Forms some of the forms of new monasticism. I mean, the community of St. Anselm at, at, um, at Lambeth Palace, for example, where you have sort of every year about 20 young people who come from a variety of different Christian traditions live together for a year and provide a ministry of hospitality there and also do some work in the local community. That's, that's clearly profoundly important for them. And I met a number of them. In fact, some of them have come back to work in Lambeth Palace later because they have been formed by that. So I, I think that's, those kinds of communities can model for us in some ways what it means to really live together as Christians. And as I say, I think the, the sharp edge of difference then falls away. It doesn't mean that we all become the same. It just means that actually, uh, you know, we cease to misunderstand each other. And, yeah. Okay, time for one more question from Meta. Um, I have one question, you talk about working together. Mm. Um, I was sa very saddened, I visited an old friend who's over 90 in a, a nursing home, and it is a Catholic nursing home in London. Um, it was the only one who could offer her what she needed. 
and she is not allowed to have communion with them. Yeah. They have Eucharist twice a week, but she's not allowed to take part. I think that's very sad, and I didn't think that that was the case these days. Well, uh, I, I could be corrected on this, but I suspect that the pastoral guidance that Catholic bishops work with would allow her to receive communion, in fact, and that it's probably uh, the local priest or whoever's responsible who is taking that, that view. But not being able to receive communion, as I said before, does remain a significant, painful, you know, point of pain for many people. And, um, and I, you know, always say, but you, you, you do have to understand that, in a sense, this must be based on mutual respect. And so, um, you know, on the, um, I mean, my wife usually comes to, although she's Roman Catholic, she usually comes to Anglican services, um, but she won't receive communion. Um, if I go to a Catholic church with her, then I won't receive communion. I will go up to receive a blessing, but that's, but I, what I should not do is deceptively receive communion because it's my view that I ought to be able to, if you see what I mean. I think we have to respect each other's ecclesial disciplines. But it's, it's, it's very sad, yeah. And I suspect that, 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 that actually that, that doesn't need to be the case in that instance. But I might be wrong. I, I think that sadness really actually demonstrates the vital importance of ecumenism and the effort to bring our churches into closer communion of all sorts with one another. I also think that perhaps there should be a support group set up for... Church of England priests who are married to Roman Catholics. <laughs> Very helpful. Yeah. Um, Actually, there is one. Is there? there there's uh, there's uh, something Simon called the Association of Interchurch Families, which is... <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Very good. Wonderful. I just want to say a huge thank you. thank you. As I said, this subject is incredibly important, and we've touched on some of the reasons why, and you've really led us through a bit of the history and your personal journey with that, and that's... That's a wonderful thing, and I hope that's really connected with people, and I really hope that that will invigorate our churches together in Putney and Roehampton, and if you're from slightly further afield, in your churches together uh, movements where you are. So can we say a really big thank you to Jeremy? Thank you. It's been fun. Thank you. There's absolutely no need to rush off. If you would like to stay and have a, a drink, a glass of water or a glass of wine, then, then please do stick around for a bit and, um, yeah, and, and do talk to one another because that is the very basis of a human. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. That's right. Yeah. Oh, that's all right. It's, um, it's very interesting to hear what people, what things people come up with.